Okay, go ahead and uh, introduce. Uh, once again, uh, I want to welcome every participant to this new symposium of Atlantic International University on this topic, innovation for achieving sustainable development. Uh, earlier, I presented a few details as to the rationale behind that obligation to uh, try our very best to innovate in every sphere of action wherever we are uh, evolving it is essential, it is fundamental, it is critical that uh, we say bye-bye to the old ways, the old techniques, the old strategies, and uh, we innovate in a way that uh, whatever we do, whatever we say, can be adapted, adjusted to modern society. In that context, uh, once again, welcome to everybody. and. Uh, Let's get ready, ladies and gentlemen, to hear the first speaker, Professor Kenneth K. Wenda, a World Bank employee stationed in Washington, D.C., the United States of America. Welcome, Professor Mwenda. Your mic is muted, Professor Mwenda. Th thank you so much. Uh, All right. Yeah, I think I had the same problem. I unmuted and somehow <laughs> kind of muted. Yeah. So thank you so much and uh, looking forward to the symposium. So um, without much ado, I'm conscious of time. First of all, I want to recognize uh, the presence of all faculty for the university who are present and to thank you all for this invitation as well as the students and other researchers uh, in the academic community who are present with us today. So let me go straight into sharing the screen but before and I start my presentation, Professor I just to... Kenneth Wenda, can you tell us a little bit about you? Where sure, you, I was, was going to say in, that. In your job, okay. Yes, I was going to say that. So before I get started, uh, let me start with number one, a disclaimer that the views that I'll present are solely my own uh, views. They should not be attributed to any organization or employer, oh. but simply uh, to myself as, as a scholar. Uh, I'm originally from Zambia and I was a Rhodes Scholar at the University of Oxford where I studied and uh, I taught in the United Kingdom at one of the top 10 schools there, University of Warwick in the 90s, before I joined the World Bank about 20, 24 years ago. Uh, but I've kept a foot in academia. I currently serve as extraordinary professor of law at University of Western Cape in South Africa, and I've served as extraordinary professor of law at the uh, University of Pretoria as well in South Africa, uh, and held a number of visiting professorships at the University of Cape Town, University of Mishkos in Hungary, and as adjunct professor of law at the American University here in Washington, DC. Um, I served uh, for a number of years as senior counsel in the legal department at the World Bank. I'm now program manager. Uh, so that's a little bit about my background. And um, I have a website for further details in terms of my scholarly publications and, and, and so forth. So I hope that's, uh, that's helped. Now, like I said, uh, these are the presentation that I'm gonna make is solely my, uh, my own scholarly work and should be attributed to me uh, as a scholar solely. But what I'm gonna do now, I'll upload, um, if you will, my presentation so that I can share it with, uh, with people there. Um, let's see. Can you all see the presentation? Yes, we can see it. Okay, great. I'm gonna expand the, yeah, there we go. So. Okay. That looks perfect. Okay, so um, today's presentation basically stems from a study that um, I, I carried out um, when I was sort of working on a project uh, with NSAID, uh, which is a leading business school in France and Singapore, uh, looking at uh, innovation in business education, uh, the case of online programs. If you look at the UN Sustainable Development Goals, in particular, goal number four, it talks about primarily uh, the issue of uh, developing sustainable educational uh, programs and then making them accessible um, to different audiences. So this is sort of the, the background against which um, this presentation has been developed. Now, the presentation looks at innovation of many leading business schools to introduce uh, what we are seeing uh, almost everywhere in the world today, uh, short online executive programs. And I'm, I'm trying to 
close the screen because it's, okay, there we go, thanks. The, so we are seeing a number of executive programs uh, coming up as the new model of delivering business education to clients around the world. Uh, so the presentation identifies potential trends and disruptions facing many leading business schools today. Uh, even leading international investors that previously shied away from online education are now turning to this digital platform for the delivery of some of their executive education programs. And here it's important that we distinguish business school programs for online executive education from what we call MOOCs. Uh, now MOOCs are simply free online courses that are available for anyone to enroll. You don't need any uh, sort of uh, eligibility criteria. You can just enroll online and participate. So you see a lot of these online, but that is not what executive education is all about. Academic programs for executive education aim for value creation and value capture. That's very important. Very often when we talk about the word innovation, we tend to think of something just new. No, that's not innovation. Innovation involves value creation. It's not just changing to the new, but also creating value. So that's a very important distinction. Uh, with the, You have to have a strong value proposition. What is it that you're bringing to the table that is different from the previous sort of arrangement and why should the stakeholders buy into your agenda. Okay, so that's very important. So students learn and the universities also benefit. The speed and impact of the emerging trend of business programs for online executive education is phenomenal. Hello, my name is Sina already. Universities on different continents are embracing the concept and education is being transformed. Those universities that are slow to change will be left behind, there's no doubt. And I've put a little picture there to just demonstrate um, how uh, you know, a lecture can be recorded online. And a lot of business schools are moving into this direction. And this is particularly important for uh, people in the academic community. Uh, how do business schools and other, you know, faculties respond to these challenges of digital disruption? Now, we, we would like to pause and ask ourselves, what is the impact of online executive programs on the competitiveness of the business education sector? Okay, let's take as an example, Harvard Business School. Like many other leading universities, Harvard is a traditional academic institution that offers programs mainly on site. Today, with the emergence of business school online executive education, Harvard Business School has created what they are calling Harvard Business School Online to remain competitive. If you go to Pennsylvania, another Ivy League school, Watton Business School, has created a similar thing, Watton School uh, Online, you know, offering similar programs. You go to Cornell, another Ivy League school, eCornell has been created to offer these similar programs. So this, there's a growing trend. You can see the Stanford a Graduate Business School in California. Same thing, they have online programs running. Uh, so Harvard Business School realized that while some executive programs can continue to benefit from on-site learning, others can lead to value creation and capture through online learning. MIT, Massachusetts Institute of Technology, they're offering similar programs. The key strategy here is for a university to map its strengths, weaknesses, against the opportunities and threats in the environment, what we call a SWOT analysis. And here I do, I do a sort of a SWOT analysis to look at the, the e-learning environment for universities. What are the, the strengths for a university, for example, that is moving in, into this direction if it were to do a SWOT matrix? You may want to look at the issue of low learning cost. You know, you're not gonna spend money on paying professors. You can have a pre-recorded uh, program, run it. Uh, learner driver, learner-driven learning at your own time uh, as a learner, you can access that. It's accessible to a wider audience, easy learning management, uh, just in time, right there it's happening, wherever you are in the world, you can all learn at the same time. Uh, it's good for the shy learner who doesn't want to, they are introverts and extroverts, people who are introverts sometimes are comfortable behind the screen. Um, and then what opportunities will those trends generate? Uh, you can secure more customers as a university. You can have a wider, broader outreach, uh, provision for diverse learning, you know, different programs and opportunities um, to give you opportunity to use different ICT, uh, sharing information and resource with other institutions. You can partner up with other institutions. Uh, the weaknesses, some of them could involve limited interaction because you can't talk to the professors, it's just recorded material. You would want to consult once in a while. In, in real time, online programs, you have, you have opportunity to sort of talk to your professors. Um, there's also difficulty in developing content. Sometimes there can be that challenge uh, due to cultural differences and ICT issues. Difficulty in evaluation, um, time differences, uh, student performance might vary. There's no sort of 
you know, individualized attention to the students because they are simply learning online. So online programs are particularly good for people who are mature, uh, who've got a strong foundation, uh, not who are beginners, because, you know, beginners need a bit of uh, sort of handholding. Um, limited uh, technology in some parts of the world, uh, you know, also effective in certain limited areas, like I said, in other countries, you'll have a lot of power outages and so forth. Um, it can also be less effective in learning because like I said, you don't have that uh, personalized uh, contact with your instructors or your, your professors. You're simply learning online all by yourself. You, you don't have much support. As a result of these weaknesses, what are the threats that can be generated in the environment, the external environment? The, the weaknesses and strength are mainly internal. The, the opportunities and threats are external. So the cost to develop the system, we have to think of this, that is a server learning management system, for example, the content and the difficulty of standardization due to changes in ICT environment, uh, diffusion of new technology and so forth. So this is sort of a general uh, SWOT matrix to try and map out the landscape. Now, the issue of the school's resources and capabilities are also important if you're going to move in that direction. The emergence of attractive business school programs for online edu education uh, challenges other business schools resources and capabilities in as far as creating and capturing value through online learning is concerned. And more resources need to be invested in developing capabilities for uh, digital platforms of online learning. Many leading universities today are catching up with creating and capturing value through business school programs for online executive education. And indeed the world is changing and the location of some clients or consumers is not always inside the walls of the university. Many exist, like myself, outside of those universities, but I continue to teach at many universities and the digital platform then brings them to the classroom. For example, this year, because of the pandemic, I didn't travel to South Africa, I had to give my lectures online. Uh, last year, same thing, I couldn't travel to Pretoria, I had to give my, um, uh, my lectures online. Uh, so we are seeing a, a, a lot of changes uh, given what's happening uh, in the world. The world has become one global place. Um, now, what are the responses of many universities in the developing world to the images of online executive education? Many universities in Africa, for example, have remained largely traditional with limited online learning initiatives. But with the emergence of private universities, the landscape is changing very fast. Private universities are likely to embrace the digital platform of are learning at a much faster rate. And the state universities have few options but adapt in order to remain competitive. Even in the US, if you look at sort of the top schools, the Ivy League schools, there was a lot of resistance from the beginning to go online. Much of the thinking was that we need on-site type of programs. People have to come to the university, experience the culture of learning in a university. But the world is changing. It's a competitive world. You, you can't stick to the old model, otherwise you, you, you get left out. There are many case studies, for example, you look at Kodak. Kodak was a company that was uh, producing um, films. You know, you, you take a, a photo using a camera, you take it to Kodak, they process it. Kodak did not adapt quickly to the digital environment. Cell phones came on the, on the scene, people could take photos and videos just from their phone. So, Kodak did not adapt, Kodak was left behind. A lot of companies that have remained behind from adaptation have sort of lost out in the market. And it's the same thing that applies to investors. Now, top investors are realizing, hey, wait a minute, we need to rethink our model. While we have a good brand, we don't want to dilute our brand. We can create, for example, a new entity that will run these other programs. That, so we remain relevant and we keep creating value in the market. So the existing strategy of traditional on-site learning can benefit from adapting to the model of business school online executive education. I've given some examples of many Ivy League schools. Even the UK, uh, you look at Oxford University, they're offering those programs. You look at London Business, which is one of the top business schools in the UK, they're also offering uh, online programs. Indeed, not all potential students of a university have time to attend full-time on-site academic programs. Mature students, family concerns, mortgage, and so forth. I, I don't have time to go to school for full time, you know. So that's the thinking. So why can't I do it online? And nowadays you can even get a PhD and a master's degree online, you know, uh, as long as you've got you know good systems in place. Many mature age students cannot leave their work and families to go back to school. So adaptation and refinement can help universities create and capture more value as more people get 
opportunities to learn. Equally, more universities will improve their revenue streams through value creation and value capture. Now, strategies for adaptation for business schools in the developing world. One way is to partner with some leading universities that are already offering or planning to offer some business school programs for online executive education. Because you're a new starter, piggyback on the experience and resources of an established university, you can benefit from that. Also, test some pilots or experiments of business school programs for online executive education with the view of learning quickly what works, what does not work, and how to improve. Then, what are some of the key questions and uncertainties that business schools in the developing world are likely to face and would want to answer to sharpen their approach? The key questions and uncertainty, uncertainties for the introduction of digital platform for business school online as executive education relate mainly to technology and demand uncertainties. What do I mean? Many potential students in Africa, for example, have limited access to the internet and thus face technology uncertainties. The frequent power outages across Africa and parts of Asia, Latin America is the same story, including Eastern Europe, areas that I've worked on and covered, Central Asia is the same story. Uh, so frequent power outages can impact negatively on the digital platform and thus lead to demand uncertainty. The cost of internet usage, for example, can also lead to demand uncertainty in some countries. Um, Zoom, for example, is free for 30 minutes. After that, you have to pay. Uh, now, if you think of developing countries, it's pretty hard for somebody to afford um, Zoom for more than 30 minutes. So those are some of the challenges, whereas in the developed country, it's not a big deal. It's a piece of cake. You can always you know, find a, a dollar here and there and then squeeze in your time. Now, the emergence of new products and services in the delivery of business education. What we are seeing is that there are changes relating to online executive programs uh, coming on board and making higher education at top business schools accessible to many students from different parts of the world who cannot afford full-time studies. Uh, a decade ago, you could not get a qualification or a certificate, professional certificate from Harvard Business School, for example, from Wharton or London Business School, instead, uh, online. You had to physically go there and it was more expensive. But now some of these programs are being uh, delivered online. So the digital platform is often less costly to run than lectures given in person since digital material is often times pre-recorded and posted on the platform for students to work with. By contrast, if you're paying professors to teach per hour, even adjunct professors, you have to pay, it's the same thing as having a doctor uh, in place attending to you as a, as a patient, uh, as opposed to maybe um, having pre-recorded information about certain ailments and medications. Uh, of course, that might be an extreme example, but if it's already diagnosed, you know, maybe that could help. The other issue is value creation. Uh, when you're looking at new products, the willingness of the students themselves to pay, we call it WTP, these mm -hmm. online programs and the resource cost of the universities in setting and administering the programs offers okay. universities value creation mm -hmm. that they can capture if they are not competitors in the segment of higher education. Again, it's a competitive environment. You're not the only ones doing this. Others are also doing the same thing. How do you position yourself? Further, the pricing of most of these online executive programs does not exceed the willingness of the students to pay, creating some good value for the customer. Okay, you can get your certificate from Harvard Business School for as little as three thousand uh, dollars. Okay, um, Harvard Business School online, you know, in various um, fields or especially strategic management, leadership, and so forth. Same thing, you can go to Wharton Business School and get a certificate uh, you know, from Wharton uh, School Online for about 4,000, 3,000, somewhere around there. You know, whereas if you were to go in person for that same qualification, you'd probably pay three, four times more uh, because that's on-site learning. You have to consider staff time for the professors, accommodation, food, transport to get to university and so forth. So you pay a lot more money, okay? Now, Barriers to uh, digital disruption. Uh, very often, when you set up a program, you want to ensure that you insulate yourself from your competitors. What are the barriers that will help you or which you, sh you should sort of put in place so that you know, you're not uh, affected by competition in terms of pushing you out of the market? Who and costly internet services in some parts of the world affects the volumes of sales? Uh, the number of students who register for these online executive courses is also affected, okay? So first of all, before we go to the barriers of the business itself, the other barriers, 
you know, it's expensive to get into the market, uh, limited disposable income, people don't have enough money to pay for these things, electricity outages I pointed out, computer literacy, some students don't even know how to use a computer that well, um, you know, so there are challenges to how to use software and so forth. But who is impacted by these uh, developments? Business schools generally, uh, especially in regard to executive programs that are offered full-time, as well as some full-time degree programs that are too costly. Okay, so when these programs are rolled out, the online programs, the guys who are offering full-time programs, they'll definitely feel the impact. Okay, because the other universities who are offering online programs will still your, your, your customer base. Others who go to those universities, why should I go full-time when I can get that degree elsewhere? Prospective students are impacted also negatively by the barriers to digital uh, disruption alighted above, as they cannot study if the barriers are not lifted. Prospective employers are also impacted negatively if the barriers to digital uh, disruption prevent prospective students from attending business school, thus limiting the pool of good hires. Now, uh, uncertainty and data, there are issues of um, demand uncertainty for this yeah. online executive program could arise in parts of the world facing some of the barriers to digital disruption listed above. Uh, technology uncertainty also can uh, affect access to data due to poor or costly internet services, as well as frequent electricity outages. So these are some of the uncertainties that we have to look at when we look at uh, the landscape. Now, new players versus uh, incumbents. The new players, again, this, if you do a SWOT matrix or what we call Porter's Five Forces to look at the threats of entrance in the market, there are new players coming in. In the delivery of online, are uh, you realizing high volumes of sale and better value proposition across a larger geographical zone compared to the incumbents who are either too slow or reluctant to adapt? I gave an example of Kodak. Uh, you can recruit more students via the digital platform across the world than relying mainly on full-time degree programs that often take a limited number of slots and are costly to run. Also, the resource cost of full-time business school programs include the high salaries of professors teaching full-time, as well as limited space in the classroom that can accommodate only a certain number of students. By contrast, the digital platform does not demand much time from the professors once the recording of a lecture is done and there's no issue of limited classroom space, notwithstanding the occasional question and answer session that can be set up like on a Wednesday at 10 to 15, you all zoom in I'll, uh, as a professor, I'll, I'll give a session of 30 minutes to respond to your questions, okay? So because of the large number of sales from online executive programs, the pricing of the courses uh, is reasonable at many business schools, creating value for the students who could have paid much more money had they gone in full time for the same executive program, okay? Now, cost implications in the delivery of these online education programs. The use of automated systems in the delivery of online executive programs by many business schools cuts down on the resource cost. Uh, for the delivery of education, given that you often do not need a professor to sit through the classroom physically. Uh, for the most part, like I pointed out, once a lecture is recorded, it can be viewed at many at any time during the course by the students from different parts of the world. And the professor does not have to be physically there. As a result, the professor does not need to be paid each time the video of his or her lecture is being viewed by the students, unlike when he or she has to give lectures physically in a lecture room. So it's much cheaper. Because of the low resource cost of using the digital platform and the larger volumes of sale from the recruitment of several universities across the world, you can get more students. A business who can afford to price the tuition of online courses at a reasonable rate and continue operating the programs profitably. The affordable prices of online executive programs and the prospects for value creation, e.g. in the brand name of the university, for example, people registered at Harvard Business School because they wanna get the name Harvard. That's a brand. So Harvard Online has a lot of students. Wharton Business, they wanna get that brand name Wharton on their CV, okay? So you find that you have many students and that increases the customer willingness to pay. Factors that could slow down digital disruption. Demand uncertainty for online executive education in those parts of the world where one internet, I said, is slow uh, or not reliable, macroeconomic conditions relating to low incomes that might not enable prospective students to register online, you know, like poor salaries, people are not paid and so forth. Uh, technological challenges, I mentioned these uh, ICT ecosystem challenges where the demographics of prospective students who are computer literate or have access to computer is quite small. Downward pressures as opposed to upward pressures seem to affect the cost more as there is no threat to say more advanced technology coming from above. 
Uh, and then factors lowering the customer's willingness to pay. What are the factors? Low incomes, I pointed out. Alternative choices in the industry, I can go elsewhere. Uh, what we call switching, if you studied negotiation, what is the cost of switching? If I can switch at a, cost, a lower cost, I can easily go to the alternative. The pricing of tuition fees by some business schools can also lower customers' willingness to pay. Now, va variation in value creation across customers and products. It's not systematic, it's not uniform. Reasons for shift in value creation uh, and you know, across customers and uh, products altogether. So there's the issue of resource costs in the delivery of online education, uh, the customer willingness to pay, like I said, these are issues that affect uh, value creation across customers and products. Equally, the availability of alternative choices, like I pointed out. Uh, products and services are most and least impacted by online education. Full-time MBA degree programs, for example, have been impacted to some extent, not entirely, but to some extent, as some prospective students find online executive programs more affordable and less costly. But it will not give you alumni status. Remember, most of these online programs won't give you alumni status. There is an age for some people still to go for full-time programs like MBAs or, or online degree programs, as opposed to certificate programs for them to get the alumni status. And it makes a big difference when you're applying for jobs. And full-time executive programs have been impacted most. Yes, you see the difference I say some, there I say most. It's the full-time executive programs that have been impacted most as they tend to be more costly than online executive programs. If the full-time executive program is not giving me alumni status, why would I spend more money going full-time? I might as well do it online. Uh, but the MBA gives me alumni status. I wanna do it, maybe if I do it online, I'll pay or go full-time, okay? However, full-time undergraduate and doctoral programs of many business schools are least affected by the emergence of online executive programs because these programs do not operate as undergraduate or PhD programs. Mainly they are somewhere in between a bachelor's degree and a master's degree or slightly above a master's degree. Uh, for those who do professional continuous development. Key uncertainties in the business education industry and the issue of data. Available data for making assessments. Uh, in, uh, you find that a number of students registered for online programs at a number of business schools uh, are not easy to capture. You don't know who's where, how many students have been registered because it's all over the place. The diversity of countries where these students are located, again, very broad. Uh, you need a lot of statistical data to capture. Uh, some of some of this some of these data, uh, the frequency of the cohorts or intakes of uh, online um, executive programs that's also very important to capture. Uh, then key uncertainties where data is missing, uh, demand uncertainty that can affect the willingness to pay. You have to look at that, especially where disposable incomes are low for the procurement of online educational services. Also technological uncertainties, we've spoken about this, uh, that can affect the willingness to pay. You also have to look at these uncertainties uh, as you strategize. So it's mainly a strategic framework to uh, developing these programs for online learning. Now, traditional value chain and changes brought about by online executive education. High schools, uh, degree granting colleges and professional certification bodies, public sector firms, private firms, are the key sources of student supply to the primary activity of delivering executive programs at business schools. Then the supporting activities, okay, to, to support the primary activity, that impact on the industry value chain include activities pertaining to the university infrastructure, the university brand, the human resource management function, uh, and retaining leading faculty, as well as those relating to technology uh, at a the university. There are three things that an academic yeah. does principally. One, research two, teaching, yeah. three, public outreach, and yeah. you know, um, uh, community service. So these are the three uh, sort of pillars for an academic in any country you go to, research, teaching, and contribution to public, uh, public life or service or community service, they call it in other countries. So the traditional value chain of business schools education continues to evolve with pressures from emerging practices of other leading business schools offering online education. The MBA degree, for example, the MBA degree, for example, is not, a pop, is not as popular as it was, say, two decades ago, since the job market is now saturated with different types of MBAs. Even universities that never used to offer MBAs are now offering universities. When I was a student at Oxford as a Rhodes Scholar in the early 90s, 92, 94, there was no business school in Oxford. 
you know, now there is side business school uh, in Oxford, you know, so Oxford is now offering an MBA. In the olden days, Oxford would offer those traditional courses like an MPhil in management over two years, masters in philosophy and management studies. You know, so a number of universities are, another program I remember at Oxford, which was not there, was a master's in public policy. Now there's a school of government in Oxford. They are offering degree programs, which mirror what you find at Harvard and other American universities like in public policy. So all these changes are happening and universities have to be attuned to di different uh, developments in the industry, okay? I'm trying to move my screen off there. So business schools are now turning to a more cost-effective way of delivering management, leadership, and business education through the digital platform. As a complement of the traditional and expensive full-time uh, executive certificate and MBA program. So these... Can you mute your microphones, please? I can hear people talking in the background. Can you mute your microphones? Now, business schools have realized that some corporate executives do not have the time to register for an MBA or already have one, but simply would like to get some in-depth exposure to latest managerial practices and theory through short online courses. So that's one of the attraction. And indeed, some full-time executive certificates at top business schools range from 40,000 US dollars to about 82,000 over a period of one week or one month, beating even the cost of many full-time MBA programs at other universities. So you have to really think through this. Many customers now realize that it's much cheaper where possible to pursue executive certificate programs online as opposed to full-time study. That said, several business schools are able to create and capture value from online education programs given the large volumes and sizes of most online classes. Indeed, volume matters, okay? Now, in the value chain highlighted above, uh, the digital disruption of online e executive programs at many business schools seems to be the most value creating following the decline of popularity of many MBA degree programs in recent times. In the olden days, in the 70s, 80s, getting an MBA say from Harvard or Wharton or Stanford, MIT, all these top schools almost guaranteed you of you know, several high paying jobs. Yes, even now you still can get a good job, but it's not as easy as, as it was in the seventies because there was less competition. You know, Many schools now are offering MBA programs, okay? Uh, and so when you look at supply and demand, you know, the demand of MBA program is not as it was in the seventies. You know, the bigger investors are the monopoly, but now, we have other you know, universities offering MBA programs at the lesser cost impact. Of course, you have to look at the name, of, the name of the university and so forth. The current trend points to a greater potential for value creation for those business schools that are able to respond to, to this digital disruption by introducing short online executive programs or partnering with leading universities to deliver the same. Indeed, the leap in value creation now mainly lies with online executive programs, as opposed to the traditional full-time graduate business school programs that are generally longer as popular longer as popular as, as there were some two no, no longer as popular as there were some two decades ago it's important however for business schools to retain and maintain both full-time business degree programs and short online executive programs especially that much of the teaching that goes into online executive program draws on the strengths of the full-time degree programs faculty and research now changing a business school positioning within the industry value chain. How do you position yourself? For those business schools and universities that are slow to respond, as I pointed out earlier, to the emerging trend of short online executive program, they might find themselves poorly positioned in the industry value chain. To position themselves better, they should consider the value creation through online executive programs in addition to their current full-time offerings. These business schools and universities do not have to drop what they are currently offering but can find ways to supplement the same with online executive education. Now, I won't go into detail, given for example, under the traditional industry value chain, what you expect and under digital disruption, uh, what you expect. A lot of these issues, like for example, many full-time degree programs for traditional, a few part-time executive programs, many full-time one week uh, executive certificate programs, high tuition fees, smaller volumes of cohorts, um, the benefit of talking to the experts, the professors, real life experience. On the other hand, you have many online business education for digital disruption, much cheaper tuition fees, larger volumes of cohorts, automated teaching systems, limited opportunity to talk to experts, that's your professors, solitary work, your own, mainly working on your own. 
uh, as, as an individual. You don't get the benefit of working in a group with others when you're in full-time learning. Now, while the well-known business model of full-time business degree and executive programs at many business schools does not enhance, sorry, does enhance value creation, there is indeed more value creation in adding on some online executive programs uh, to the portfolio of programs that you're offering at your business school. In value creation, volume is an important, is as important as price, very critical. In value creation, volume is as important as price. And that is where good online education comes in to supplement and complement traditional full-time business education. Without doubt, online ed executive education is much cheaper to the customer than full-time degree or executive education. Also, the digital platform makes the cost of delivering uh, online ed executive much affordable since no professor has to, to sit the whole day in front of the camera talking to the students. You can reach a wider audience in line with the SDGs. You can reach people in the rural areas as long as they have access to technology, computers, and so forth, and they, are, they know how to use the technology. You, you can offer education and reach uh, larger sectors of the society, which traditional methods of teaching might not be able to reach. Also, the digital platform makes the cost of delivering online education much more affordable, like I, po I pointed out. Uh, there's an apparent shift in trends, as well as a recognition by many business schools that there's greater value creation in the delivery of short executive programs to frequent cohorts in a year. On its own, full-time business education may not offer business schools much value creation as the enrollment of students for MBA degree programs is not as high as it used to be, say, two decades ago. It's very expensive to invest in an MBA from a really top school. Very, very expensive. You end up spending, if it's a two-year program, maybe about 180000 You know, Business schools must adapt to the digital disruption brought about by the emergence and popularity of short online executive programs to complement the existing model of full-time business degree and executive programs. So synergy between full-time traditional education and online education will only serve to promote greater value creation. Thus, our value propos proposition is that a business school can gain more from offering both traditional full-time business education and the short online executive programs as the two programs tend to attract different profiles of candidates. That's very important. Now, newly digitally enabled products and services that could be launched as you move in this direction, if you decide to move in that direction. So short online executive programs, partnerships, I've highlighted this, uh, adapt some of them to blend online and full-time. You can have a hybrid model, six months online, and then the other six months uh, in residence. Um, you look at uh, online education from top university, for example, often raises the willingness to pay. Uh, compared with full-time programs at the same university. You know, if you look at the incomes of people uh, who are registering for, for these programs. Uh, lowering the resource cost, online education has lower resource costs. I alluded to this. Uh, target customers, think about adult learners who have uh, commitments and so forth. And here I sort of do a, a value chain to demonstrate um, taught programs uh, in business schools, uh, you know, uh, the primary activity and the supporting activities and, and, and so forth. I've already explained this, but that's in a diagram form. Now, threats of sustain, uh, sustainability facing some business schools. Uh, innov innovation, many business schools are developing innovative uh, executive programs similar to what my, you know, my, my school, for example, at, at Oxford uh, and other business schools are offered. The implications of such developments are that uh, Universities like Oxford and Harvard has come up with a digital strategy to sustain a competitive advantage. Some smaller schools are simply replicating the executive programs offered at these schools and other top schools. Again, the implications here are similar to those stated above. Now, shifts in the higher education industry. As the popularity of MBA degree program wanes, the shifts or trends in graduate business school education favor online programs, giving rise to fewer threats to the model of online education. For a number of universities, there are hardly any major threats to the delivery of online education, uh, making the digital learning platform quite attractive. Again, you can enjoy the monopoly, but for such a period of time. Now, I'm conscious of time, and that's why I'm sort of really rushing through the presentation. I'm now getting to the conclusion. I was given about 30 minutes. Now, to conclude, barriers to imitation, favoring some business school. What barriers can we adopt to avoid people who want to imitate us to take over the business? 
tacitness, complexity, specific, specificity in business school pedagogical skills and resources can generate uh, causal ambiguity in competence-based advantage and thus raise barriers to imitation. For example, the more specialized you are, the more difficult you, it, it is to replace you. If you're a general player in any industry you are, even if you think of economics, uh, you know, mineral resources, if you are producing as an economy, copper, for example, copper is easily, easily substitutable. So, you know, the buyers can go to another mineral resource which can substitute copper. Unless there's war, copper is used for, you know, making bullets and so forth. So, but if you get into an industry where you have expertise, you're the only guy or a few others in that industry, the chances of you being pushed out or being replaced is less less than if you were sort of a general player. So that's very important. So make sure that the product you're offering, the service has has some degree of complex, complex is quite complex and very specific. Uh, that's very important. Uh, and it shouldn't just be something that's too general, okay? For example, you're offering a product like a master's degree program in taxation. Taxation is very specific, intellectual property law. That's very specific. But just a general master's degree in law, anybody can offer that. So why am I coming to you? Okay, but because it's unique, I want to specialize in tax and you're the only guys offering tax, you get me, okay? So that issue of complexity and um, uh, specificity is very, very important. To sustain these barriers, reinvestment in casually ambiguous competences is vital. Um, such reinvestment is necessary to protect and sustain the advantage that a business school enjoys. So on that note, I'm available to take any questions. Thank you very, very, very much, uh, Professor Kenneth Mwenda. Your presentation really on my end has earned very, very high marks. You've been outstanding from multiple uh, vantage points. And uh, we really are very, very proud of uh, someone uh, of your caliber. Uh, let me uh, remind the uh, participants that we just listened to uh, Professor Kenneth uh, Mwenda uh, from uh, Zambia. He is a law professor at uh, the University of Western Cape in Cape Town, South Africa. And uh, he has made what I call an outstanding uh, presentation on products and services in the world of online business education. Uh, pretty much like he just uh, concluded, he is now uh, available for your questions. And I'm gonna go first to uh, uh, Onwusa, who's been uh, having his hand up uh, for quite a while. On Wusa from Nigeria. Go ahead, please, with your question. Uh, make sure you turn on your microphone. On Wusa. Your mic is still off, On Wusa. All right. As we wait for On Wusa to become fully ready for his questions, let's go now to uh, Nicholas Goodhead. Nicholas, uh, turn your microphone on, please. And uh, we are ready for your question. Nicholas apparently also has an issue with turning the microphone on. Uh, let's try Eric Chiampong. Eric. Now, I guess that I should turn also to our uh, sound engineer, uh, Felipe. Uh, would you please uh, double check whether there is an issue with uh, uh, the participants' uh, microphone? I do know that it's on their end to uh, control microphones and uh, cameras, but uh, we've tried three hands uh, from Anwosa, uh, Nicholas, and Eric. None of these participants being able to uh, uh, turn their microphones on. So I don't know, Felipe, uh, whether this is a problem with our- Dr. Valfin, yes. they, they should be able to do it now. Okay, there we go. Eric, go ahead, Eric. You oh, good. 
Great. Um, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Valsin, and thank you, Professor Mwenda, for such an exciting presentation. Um, my question is simply uh, following up from your last uh, submission that universities that are more specific in their offering would uh, survive, sort of. And then also you mentioned earlier that you have to balance uh, value and volume you realize that the more you are specific with the, your offering, it's difficult to attract a large volume of uh, students across the world. So how do you balance that if you want to be profitable? Um, I hope it's clear. Okay, yeah, thank you so much, uh, Eric. Uh, if you look at Porter's writing, uh, Professor M Michael Porter, the three generic strategies in business management, one, focus, two, cost leadership, and three, uh, uh, specialization, okay? The reason for Porter's argument, and I agree with Professor Porter, is that once you distinguish yourself from your competitors, you may have a smaller niche, but you have a committed following because your services, your products, nobody else in the market is offering them. And you can, you can actually manipulate the price because you've got the monopoly, okay? But if you have several people offering the same thing you're offering, look at it uh, from supply and demand. There is excess supply. What happens to the demand? The demand curve will drop and the price will go down. Okay. That's the beauty about specialization. Okay. You cannot be easily replaced by a competitor or threats of new entrants. You've got your market niche. So, in the long term, you begin to find that even though you have, say, 2,000 students, those guys are offering generic programs. We want to be able to attract if there are so many of them competing each one only get about 10 okay all together 10 maybe they're about 70 business schools so 10 multiplied by 70 they look it looks like there's a larger volume of the 700 but they are split across 10 schools whereas if your school is offering a specialized area you've got all those students they are 200 they're all yours you're not going to share them with anybody else so i hope you get my point Thank you very much, uh, very much, Professor Kenneth. Uh, we are going now to Issa Muhammad. You seem to be ready. Go ahead, uh, Issa. We all ears, Issa Muhammad. But we can't hear you. All right. So, Birunji Mubiru, your question, please. Wow. Uh, Dr. Lambert, we seem to have another issue. I mean, looking at uh, Birunji Mubiru, for example, he's speaking right now. He's been trying to speak. Uh, apparently, from what I can see on my end, his uh, microphone and his camera are both on, but- uh, I can see that too. To... Yes. I, I think it's just his microphone's not connected. You have to go down to the left where you see a little microphone icon, click on the little hat next to it, and then you'll see options to choose other microphones on your computer. In the meantime, uh, while waiting for Burundi to have his microphone on, let's go to Nicholas Goodhead. Goodhead at this time. Thank you, Dr. Franklin. You are welcome. Uh, and thank you, uh, 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 Professor Kenneth, uh, for the uh, lovely and uh, extensive education you are, you are giving to us this, uh, this evening, this afternoon in London. Uh, my name is Nicholas Goodhaco from London. Uh, it's been a, a, a pleasure being part of uh, AIE at the International University. Uh, I've got two questions for you, uh, Professor Kenneth. Um, I know the, uh, you, you say that uh, online business education, uh, mostly good for mature people, not beginners. And I can see maybe could be the reason why uh, most countries don't actually um, adopt the online education. And for that, for that reason, they don't have uh, since to uh, uh, validate the students in their country. Um, two questions for you, one. Why uh, is it the, because of the impact of the COVID-19 that most universities are, um, are, are going online? Um, and number two, 
well, what impact have you have you from all, with, with all your educational background? You're not talking about Zambia, but you're talking about South Africa. Uh, what 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 is the impact of your education in South Africa in, in Zambia? Thank you. Okay, thank you, Th thank you so much. So let me start with the first question. Um, what are the drivers to adapting to the digital platform for by a number of universities? There are many factors that uh, have contributed. Even before COVID-19 came on board, uh, a number of universities had already moved into the direction of offering these uh, uh, online programs. But if you, if you look at the model that is adopted by some of the top Ivy League schools, for example, the business school itself, like for example, at Harvard, at Wharton, at Cornell, the business school itself does not directly offer these programs. They've incorporated or created a subsidiary known as Wharton School Online, Harvard Business School Online, uh, or eCornell at Cornell University. Okay, so that's the body through which these programs are offered. Okay, yes, the situation would have also been triggered by COVID 19 now, uh, but COVID 19 affected even the full time programs. Some of them had to go online because, you know, um, teaching had to go on, learning had to go on but we had to find innovative ways to deliver this program. So uh, it was, COVID-19 was all in, all embracing, I wouldn't limit it to executive programs. Now, the, the second question you asked, yes, I'm actually very, uh, like I said, I have a full-time job here in Washington, but I also do, I've kept my leg in academia uh, over the last two decades. I'm supervising PhD programs in back home in Zambia universities and examining, uh, as well as in South Africa. So. It's quite phenomenal, and uh, a number of my students now are Supreme Court, Constitutional Court judges, including a Chief Justice. Uh, in West Africa as well, uh, some of my students are, have been Attorney General. Uh, you're from which country, Ghana? Nigeria. Nigeria, okay, okay, yeah. Some of my students like Ghana, they've been ministers and so forth. So quite phenomenal, and I am very much in touch with um, colleagues in academia from different parts of the world. It's a, it's a world of relationships and networks. Uh, and I alluded to this even for business, because for us individuals, it's a world of relationships and networks. Uh, otherwise, you can't do much. If you have to create value, you have to work with people. Why is Zambia not feeling your impact? Zambia, it is feeling my impact, actually. <laughs> it is feeling my impact. Uh, like I said, I'm, I, I'm still, I supervise a number of students back home. And... Uh, I shouldn't maybe mention this, but because you sort of asked this question a second time, I was honored by President of the Republic of Zambia, the sixth president when he was in power, President Edgar Lungu, for my outstanding contribution to academia, um, you know, worldwide. I received the presidential medal. Thank, Thank you, you, Professor Kenneth. We're going now to Felton Yiyen. Felton? Elton, if you are closely following us, uh, please turn off, turn on your microphone and uh, speak up your question, please. That's not working, so. <laughs> uh, Jean David Lechea. It's not working either. Eptisam Clayt. Okay. Yes, uh, yes. Hello, everyone, and thank you for the invitation. Thank you, Professor Kenneth. Thank you, Dr. Lambert and Dr. Franklin. Thank you, everyone. My question is, b before asking the question, I believe and I'm confident that without peace building, without working on peace and ending all kind of major wars, okay we cannot uh, we cannot develop there is no development ahead we have uh, on the agenda we have to combat climate change poverty uh, violence everywhere um, and also inequality regarding uh, maybe gender inequality etc and all kinds of discrimination then we should uh, work on peace building and we should uh, trade not aid uh, we should uh, find a way to 
uh, not end the globalization, however, otherwise, um, and encourage encourage interdependence and open dialogue for interfaith. What what are your comments, Doctor? Thank you. Yes, uh, brilliant observation. Um, actually, much of what you've highlighted, these are things that are coming from the UN 17 UN Sustainable Development Goals. Um, you know, and they move hand in hand. Um, and you, as you will note, education is one of, uh, I think it's the fourth goal in the 17 DGs. Uh, so they go hand in hand. We cannot, we, we always have to take a systemic, holistic approach to development. Uh, as well as uh, as opposed to a reductionist approach. Uh, so we don't isolate components. We work with a comprehensive package um, you know, of reforms depending on which areas are a priority. Uh, so yeah, you've made very excellent observations and I totally agree. We have to look into issues of fragility, conflict areas, uh, look into issues of um, you know, sustainable job, uh, meaningful jobs, creation of meaningful jobs and so forth. Uh, so it's a, it's a whole comprehensive uh, package. Yeah. All right, from Dr. Thank you. Wenda to uh, Dr. Reginald Anyanwu. Dr. Reginald. Dr. Reginald is not ready. Uh, going back now to uh, Felton Yeyen, if you are now ready. Good afternoon, good morning to everyone. And uh, thank you ever so much to Dr. Kenneth Mewendad for his presentation. That was quite brilliant. <laughs> but I, I have for a catch on your presentation as it involves technology. I'm, I'm, I'm into that and, and want to understand actually what it thinks as, as the internet has brought in almost everything into the say one library and then you have a traditional form of education that brings people to the campuses. And then you have, say, online or OLC for the World Bank Group, which is um, on online learning center. You have all of these materials that are brought just as in the traditional form of learning. Now, I want us to delineate between the, the, the both um, a business context as it relates to technology that brings these together. What is the what is the missing link that uh, happens on traditional education that is not now happening in uh, digital platform or internet things? Those things that that makes it, that separates what you just spoke about. Okay, good. thank you. Again, great question. There, uh, there are limitations to online learning. Okay. And I want to start first with resource endowment in terms of literature and so forth. Yes, for example, the World Bank has put most of its publications online. You can access them. We have online resources and so forth. That's very true. Uh, and a number of universities are doing that. If you're going to Google now, Google Scholar, some of the papers, you can access them uh, for, for free. Um, but there are limitations. Certain journals or periodicals, for example, you can only access them if you have or you've registered with the university either online or in person. Then the other materials, for example, you know, if you go into some of these libraries, you have what is known as a special collections division for rare materials, which are not in digital form. They've not been digitized. So you physically have to go, if you're doing research like in archeology, span okay, you physically have to go to that special collections division to access some of these rare materials. For copyright reasons, they've been not been put out in the public. So you also have to think of intellectual property rights. There are certain documents that cannot be posted online, okay, because they are protected by copyright. Even a PhD thesis or dissertation, some universities will not publish online a PhD thesis. If you want to reference it, you have to physically go to that university. Okay, other universities, they are okay with it. They publish their, 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 all, the, all, all their students' dissertations online. So those are some of the nuances. It has to do with data privacy rights and intellectual property law, you know, especially copyright. So be mindful of that. So the traditional setup 
has certain advantages. The other advantage that you will find with traditional setting of, when I say traditional, I'm talking of on, on site as opposed to uh, sort of off site on uh, learning. The traditional on site learning has the advantage of you having access to your professors on a daily basis. You can consult, you can ask questions, okay? You can engage your professors in a discussion when you're on campus. Whereas if you are in your home, all you do is listen to the recorded version of the professor. You can't even engage him. You'll be lucky sometimes the professor will give one hour in a week, okay? Maybe at eight in the morning, he'll come online, uh, you know, at which time you have to ask questions. But it's, it's a very limited period of time and you can only ask so much because there are so many of you who want to ask questions as opposed to seeing him on a daily basis when you're on campus. And even during lectures, you can ask questions during lectures. But if you're listening to a recorded uh, message, you know, you don't you have no opportunities to ask. And this is, for example, where you, if you look at the British system of education, the Ox, Oxbridge, Oxford, Cambridge had that superiority of the tutorial system. The tutorial system is only found at Oxford and Cambridge, where you want, first of all, you have a big lecture of maybe 200 students. And then you are narrowed down to maybe two to three per tutor, intensive tuition in, in a two hour session where you can ask all sorts of questions and engage with the tutor. The learning is very intense because the ratio of teacher to student is you know, one, to, one to two or so. So it's very intensive as, as opposed to you're just listening to a lecture and then you have to decipher. And that's why I pointed out online learning is pretty good for people who are already mature. They've established, they've got a pedigree, a pedigree they're just building on. Okay, next I will, I will, I will, I was also looking at all, uh, going back to the SWOT analysis, but I will, I will catch up with you here after and see how we could go back to that SWOT analysis and look at some sure. of the, the, the weaknesses as well as the strengths. Sure. Thank you. Thank you very much again, uh, Professor Mwenda. We do realize that there are uh, participants who have been trying to uh, uh, reach that uh, Mwenda for questions, either their system uh, could not respond uh, punctually, or there was an issue of some sort which uh, we could not really pinpoint. And uh, very unfortunately, uh, we might not be able to accommodate every participant because, uh, as you know, uh, there was uh, one hour allotted to uh, that presentation, and we've uh, uh, move beyond that, and we have some other presenters who are D Dr. Welsi. Yes, uh, we have talked to Dr. Chansa, who would be presenting now. He has conceded time to Professor Kenneth Wenda <laughs> to to continue to answer questions. So, and then he will adjust his time. Okay. Accordingly. All right, but as I said again, uh, one problem that we've been having is. Uh, uh, the, the, the failure of the system, some students have both their microphones and their cameras on uh, from what uh, we can see on our end. But uh, when we uh, open the floor to them, they still could not. Uh, I am ready. I am uh, ready. I am okay. ready. Go ahead. <laughs> okay. Uh, my name is Dr. Reginald. Uh, I'm an alumni of uh, AIU. Uh, I'm speaking from Canada. Uh, professor Ken, I appreciate your presentation, but I, I have lectured over at my professor back home and then I came to join AIU. I must tell you that AIU has answered most of the challenges. Any adult, or whether young or old, has answered most of the problems or challenges faced in education, online education. Uh, however, uh, the time ratio you were talking about I feel AIU has also provided the, the, that platform to, to, to react speedily uh, with, uh, with students, the interaction between students and the lecturer uh, has been so wonderful and uh, there has not been any delay. Uh, I appreciate your presentation, sir. And uh, I will appeal to AIU to, to I want to have uh, the slide that uh, the slide of this year presentation that I found because I find it very interesting. And, uh, I want to encourage uh, the family of AIU to continue to do a good work. Uh, AIU is wonderful. Uh, I have uh, the experience I have with AIU is very is unique, and I want to encourage all of you to continue to keep it up. Thank you very much. 
Yeah, th thank you for those uh, wonderful remarks. So definitely we'll coordinate with uh, Dr. Chanza and I think I can make the slide available to you. All right, thank you. Yes, please. Professor Mwenda, there is a question from one of the participants. Uh, let me see if I can find that question again. The question is, what are the components of innovation for education? Thank you for that, Dr. Lambert. Yeah, now they, there is no sacrosanct or succinct sort of model or a template that you can say under the requirement for innovation. No, it's all about strategic management, okay? Strategic thinking, in fact, the, 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 the trend now is to move from strategic planning to strategic thinking, uh, you know, because it's much more open-minded uh, and it depends on the environment. You have to audit the environment, okay? There are many factors that come into play. For example, the issue of accreditation is very important. Employers respond to accreditation, even though accreditation is a voluntary process. In many jurisdictions, accreditation is not mandatory it's voluntary and is carried out by a private body, rarely by a state entity. In some countries, accreditation is done by state agencies, but in other countries, it's prof you know, private professional bodies. Now, why do these matter when you're looking at the ex external environment? Employers, for example, will be hesitant to recognize certain qualifications from an accredited schools, okay? Uh, so one has to be very careful. Okay, so all these are factors that will drive your strategy. That is why sometimes you have programs which are offered by an established and well-regarded school so that you piggyback on that to overcome obstacles of accreditation. You know, uh, so all these are factors that you have to take into account, okay? Uh, there are other issues, for example, uh, when you're looking at innovation, uh, be careful when you're designing a curriculum. Uh, one shortcoming which the UK has addressed very effectively is that you cannot teach in a British university if you're not certified in teaching methods and curriculum. I had to do that. I had to be certified at University of Warwick when I was a lecturer there. Okay, Harvard uh, offers a similar program actually online. I took that program online from Harvard School or Graduate School of Education. They teach you in teaching methods how to design a curriculum, how to assess students and so forth. In Africa, where I come from, all you need to do is get a master's and PhD and you're appointed as a lecturer. Now, teaching is a profession. It's, a, it's not guesswork. You have to be taught how to teach even if you have a PhD. It's very, very important. Otherwise, you end up misleading students. Okay, so these are issues that we all have to think through as we innovate. All right, uh, thank you very much for that uh, clarification, Dr. Mwenda. Uh, let's try uh, Shepard and Kobe from South Africa. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Dr. Valson. Good afternoon. Brother. Thank you so much. Uh, and uh, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Mwenda, um, Mwenda and uh, Dr. Lambert. Thank you so much for this program. This symposium is so. Um, Enlightening, to say the least. Uh, back to Dr. Mwenda. Uh, you talked about intellectual property for the um, um, printed material. That's true. Uh, may I know if there is intellectual property rights for online material? Because I can see that there are, you have mentioned that there are these other kind of copycat uh, colleges and uh, universities that kind of steal or take your programs and make them uh, theirs. Is it a free for all world uh, survival of the fittest uh, kind of environment or what? As an accomplished professor and uh, uh, a teacher of law, uh, wow. is there something being done by the law society to protect the intellectual rights of the online programs? Yeah, if, if, look, any university, any university, whether it's offering online or on-site person, the material that the university gives you or produces itself under the copyright of the university. Cop copyright law mm. protects not the idea, but the expression mm. of the idea. 
Okay, that's what copyright law does. So okay. yes, certain materials, even if they are online, sometimes mm -hmm. you find there's even specification that this material should not be reproduced. ABC. There's a there's a sort of a caption there, you know. And even if it's online, if you're going to use that material, you should acknowledge the author, because it's not just poor academic practice or plagiarism. It also yes. infringes on top copyright law. Okay, if you're going to use that material, you need to acknowledge the source. That's just good mm -hmm. academic practice. Uh, so whether it's, it doesn't matter where the idea is expressed, whether it's expressed online, if I post something on my Facebook page and you copy that, that's an infringement of my copyright. I'm the original mm -hmm. guy who originated that idea and expressed it. So you have to acknowledge me, okay? Because otherwise you profit from it. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Ironji Mubiro, are you ready with your question? Oh, thank you very much, Doctor. Uh, thank you very much, Professor. Uh, by, um, by name of Ironji uh, Mubiro, right away from Uganda, that is Africa. Yes. Uh, let me let me thank very fast uh, the Antwerp International University for having made uh, me to present me on the world on the country on the worldwide. So uh, my question is go, goes direct to, to the professor. Uh, since he, you know Uganda well, because you have said that you are coming from Africa, you are you are an African. I've actually uh, worked on Uganda in Uganda itself. Okay, yes. <laughs> so that's yes. good. Uh, the education of Uganda, as you saw it, uh, as you saw it, uh, it is it is relatively low. Let me say like that uh, because of missing some some online education some, on, some universities are not emphasizing more on online education not until i joined at Antarctic international university that's why i'm trying to even to see the change what i'm becoming now so uh, first so what what emphasis have you put uh, to ensure that what can you put if you are the one now? What emphasis can you put to ensure that uh, the students are engaged in communication? Because uh, me myself, I tried to connect some of the buzzes. Okay. Uh, <coughs> but I'm losing you. Are giving up. So they are not even sure that it, something is, is true. Yeah? They are not even sure enough. So what can you put in? Okay. Yeah, but, yeah. Yeah, no, yeah, quickly to, to answer your, your question. Yes, um, initially in, your, in East Africa, the, there was the University of East Africa, which was based in Dar es Salaam uh, before Makerere was set up. Then eventually, I think Makerere was, was set up. And for a long time, Makerere enjoyed that sort of monopoly in, in Uganda. Um, but now there are a number of private universities in a number of African countries. We have, we have many private universities that have sort of come up. Uh, and this is not confined to sort of or, uh, an issue of Uganda alone. It's, it's problematic in many parts of the world, the issue of regulation to offer quality education services. I think this is very important. Uh, governments have to play a key role to ensure that we sort of uh, have institutions which are providing good night, good night. Good night. Yeah, to have institutions which are providing quality educations and also even the older universities, the old traditional universities to ensure that they are not just making money, spending money out of people through what we call diploma meals. The diploma meals are basically online. Somebody sets up an online so not even an online, somebody has a post box and is selling degrees, okay? Phony degrees. So we have to regulate against those type of malpractices in the industry, okay? Uh, in my home country, Zambia, for example, uh, there's a government authority which is charged with accreditation of institutions. Some of these universities have been closed down. You call, you, some of the things that you look at when you're looking at the university, look at the qualifications of faculty who are teaching there. Okay, look at their research profile the in, in terms of, you know, their publication record, their scholarly record. Look at the infrastructure, library facilities. It will give you an indication before you even, 
investigate further of, of whether you are doing the right thing. Okay, so these are issues which the new universities in Africa and Asia and Latin America, all over the place, they are struggling with. Some are able to meet the cut, others, unfortunately, they have to fall off. Thank you again, uh, Dr. Mwenda. <laughs> Uh, Dr. Lambert, I am uh, bringing up the same issue again, uh, even though uh, our next presenter, Dr. Chenza, uh, decided to concede some of uh, his uh, time to uh, the current presentation. But uh, if we, well, let me also uh, request that those of you who are not speaking at this time to please turn your microphones off to want to mute your microphone because otherwise uh, we have an echo that is not sustainable. We're talking about sustainable development. So uh, Dr. Lambert, uh, let me have your essay on uh, uh, what we do because uh, the presentation of uh, Professor Mwenda has been so uh, interesting, so outstanding. If, uh, I mean, uh, there, there is a, a, an option that we also made available for participants to ask their questions also through the chat line. But if we continue like this, uh, that uh, Wenda is gonna just ask for some time off <laughs> because it could be in the next two, three hours, we still <laughs> won't be with him. So, <laughs> What do you think? Well, I, I agree that we should move on and thank Professor Kenneth Wenda for a wonderful presentation. And I suggest that if he has time, he can stay and continue to talk with people in the, in the yes. chat box. Yes. Well, th uh, thank you so much. It's been an honor. And uh, I really appreciate uh, Dr. Victor Chanza for connecting me. Uh, Dr. Valstin, thank you so much. Dr. Lambert, thank you so much. And all the faculty and the students as well. And I wish everyone all the very best. And, uh, you know, like I said, uh, you know, if there are any questions, you can send them through Dr. Chanza and uh, he'll forward them to me and I'll be glad to respond. Wonderful. Thank you very, very much. God bless you, Professor Wenda. Thank you so much. Uh, we talk